You're listening to Airing Pain, brought to you by Pain Concern, a UK-based charity working to help, support and inform people living with pain and healthcare professionals. I'm Paul Evans, and this edition has been funded by an Awards for All grant from the Big Lottery Fund in Wales. The Welsh Pain Society, Cymdaithas Poyn Cymru in Welsh, holds its annual scientific meeting each autumn. And for a country that's, how can I put it, geographically challenging, it's an invaluable opportunity for people working in the field of pain in Wales to get together, discuss best practice and, yes, pain politics, and ultimately create a better service for the patient. Its chair is Dr Mark Turtle, consultant and aesthetist specialising in pain management in Carmarthenshire. And at this year's event I asked him whether the prevalence of chronic pain in Wales is any different to other countries in the UK. There is nothing which would suggest that the prevalence in Wales is any different from anywhere else. Somewhere between upper teens and lower twenties in terms of percent. What might be different, and one of the things that we've been discussing in the last uh, day or so, is the impact on individuals. How different people cope with pain. For example, we had a lot of talk about uh, people in the valleys, people in uh, certain areas in South Pembrokeshire where perhaps they're encountering considerable social difficulties, whereas people in other areas of rural Wales, for example, uh, cope in a totally different way. So it's not so much the prevalence of the problem, but the way that people cope and deal with it, which might be, uh, well, certainly it's an issue that has to be taken into account. From the patient's point of view, do patients around Wales, from different areas of Wales, have more or less difficulty than their counterparts elsewhere? In accessing services. In accessing and yeah. knowing about services. Yes, yes. And I think one of the things that actually has come across quite strongly in the last day or so is that uh, the disparity between different areas, both in terms of overall service, so the one or two areas where people have to travel a heck of a long way to get any sort of services, and then there's also what that service is made up uh, it's quite interesting, for example, somebody showed uh, some, uh, an audit of uh, the services and uh, Powys, which is a very sparsely populated area, uh, has got very good services in some respects, even though that they're not centred around uh, a major district in hospital, for example. There are um, areas such as uh, Kerrydigion, for example, where there's hardly any first services at all. There are different clinics which have different spreads of different disciplines so the makeup is different and then we've also hardly scratched the surface to look at the relationship between the services that are available and the actual population size so for example nothing seems to take into account that in a particular area the population may be very large and therefore the services ought to be a lot better now that's even before we start looking at uh, how people access them, how they're publicised for an individual, how they know what there is to access. And that's certainly something which uh, uh, needs more work. Dr Mark Turtle. Well, the focal point of the day was a session devoted to that very topic in which a panel of three prominent health professionals in the field of pain explored issues around community pain services. The panellists were Dr Rob Davis, a specialist in pain management in Cum Tav Health Board, Dr Mark Ritchie, a Swansea GP with special interest in pain, and Sue Beckman of the Welsh Government Delivery and Support Unit. That was established by the Welsh Assembly Government, referred to later as WAG, to assist NHS Wales in delivering its key targets and level of service. Another term or acronym you hear mentioned is QOF, or Quality and Outcomes Framework. This is an incentive scheme for GP practices in the UK, rewarding them for how well they care for patients across a range of areas through a point system. Put simply, the higher the score, the higher the financial reward for the practice. There is no quaff for pain. So, with all that jargon behind us, let's join the debate. It's chaired by Dr Mark Turtle. We've uh, picked three people who are confident, not couch potatoes, so I hope that they will uh, pursue this debate with vigour. 
Sue. Thank you, Mark. And thank you very much. I feel quite privileged being here, actually, to be honest. It's quite exciting, this is. And, and to be considered that I might be somebody who would know about pain, I also find quite flattering. Because if you'd asked me a few years ago about the importance of community services for pain, I wouldn't have had a clue. I'm a diagnostic radiographer by trade. I've x-rayed many people in my time who are suffering from all kinds of conditions and terrible pain. But not once, I think, and I'm ashamed to admit it, not once, I think, had I given much thought to how they access control of that pain in their lives. And there's only really two things that have made me think about it in recent years. One was the focus on work that we did from the delivery unit. And I'm sorry that it's couched around orthopaedics, but that became our only vehicle to do this. One was the neck and back pain, when suddenly my eyes were opened to the importance of pain for people in this scenario suffering with neck and back pain and what pain actually does to people which I hadn't given much thought to before because I've been fortunate in that I don't suffer much myself. The second is watching my mother on a daily basis struggle with her pain and not be able to access the kind of pain control that I would love that she should have. So those two things made me really think. Now you'd have thought that would have been obvious. So that made me think, well if it's not obvious to you Sue, who else is it not obvious to? And I have to say that sadly, it's not obvious to a lot of people, which is why I think probably we haven't had as much investment in pain services in the community that I'm sure all of you folk here would like. And actually, I believe very passionately that good pain services based in the community will make a huge difference to the lives of individuals and will have a very positive and cost-effective effect on the NHS as a whole. £28 million, pounds, I believe, was quoted to me as the cost in neck and back pain in prescriptions alone for Wales. I think that is well worth thinking about. And aside from that, think of all the people who very quickly could access something that makes their quality of life so much better than it currently is. So on that basis alone, I'd rest my case. A really important thing to push forward. Thank you, Sue. Rob. 80% of all medical with a small M contact that patients have with clinicians across the board, 80% of all contact has pain as an element in it. Now, put that against 0.9% of the time spent as an undergraduate is pain training. So I think there is a big ask here. The whole idea of actually moving pain into the community in terms of the service that we deliver, we've got to ask a huge number of questions. What do we mean by moving pain into the community? What is the community? And do we really want to lose all those places and people that already provide a service? So I'd just like you to think about those two questions. What is moving pain into a community all about? Who do we deal with? Where do we deal with it? And how do we deal with it? Thank you. Mark. What is pain? To me, pain is not the lovely textbook definitions we get, but it's what the patient tells me it is at the end of the day. And Rob very succinctly put the 0.9% of training is in pain. He's right. That's including acute pain. It's not chronic pain. And when you look at chronic pain in undergraduate training in this country and medical professionals, it's between four and six hours, depending which university you're lucky enough to attend. Considering that, I think our general practitioners probably handle pain pretty well, <laughs> considering the little training we bother to give them. If we could spread that training a bit more, then it could become more community-based. But that shouldn't by no means mean that we throw away our secondary care colleagues or throw away those secondary care clinics. They're still going to be needed to some extent, but it's how we interact that with a good community-based service. And I think it should be an interactive and interlinked service, not community versus um, secondary care. I think it needs to be interlinked. Okay, thank you very much. So those are our opening stalls of our uh, panellists. Now let's see if we can uh, perhaps challenge those views or get them to expand a little bit with some questions. Now the first question I've got here is, on its own, is not the most efficient way to treat chronic pain in a multidisciplinary and multimodal service model? Patient access, transportation, 
clinician access to imaging results, team communication, when spread out over a population area, how can we overcome these problems? Rob? Okay, taking the, the second point first, the distribution of the population that we're dealing with and the ability to actually get staff together suggests that we need a base to work from. We've done clinics in GP practices where consultants have gone out to the practices. You end up travelling a long way, maybe seeing three patients. So it makes the case for me to have a base and bringing the patients to that base. And then there's the question about, okay, how do we get them there? The issues of transportation, the issues of car ownership, deprivation indices, all come into that. Patients, if they have a hospital on their doorstep, they like to be able to use that hospital for everything. And this is what we found moving into one of the community hospitals. Because our existing hospital was on a recognised bus route, it was close to the motorway, people knew where it was, people could get there. <coughs> for a, quite a while, I had complaints from patients turning up saying, what are you doing it up here for? We can't get up here. There are no buses to get up here. It's an important point to think. If you're going to move things into the community, that's fine as long as it's local for that particular patient. If you have a big catchment area, you've got to think strategically in terms of where you're going to base part of the service. Mark? I wouldn't want to denigrate that uh, potential issue at all. However, there are very strong advantages of being closer to where the patients are. Some of those advantages are we can start demedicalizing this problem. Mm. And as we see when we go to society, the last British Pain Society meeting I went to, something like half of all the lectures were no longer about drugs. They were on psychology, they were on physiotherapy techniques, they were on physical techniques rather than pharmaceutical techniques. A lot of these patients, when they come into a hospital setting, believe they've come for another injection or another medication. I'm not going to poo-poo those treatments at all. Where they're appropriate, they should be used. But what I'm going to say is that if we move this out of a hospital setting, people start to think out of that box and they start to think of a wider and, and, and a more diverse approach to their problem. And we've certainly seen some pretty good results. So, The word community. I can say for a fact, this is absolutely right, there is an, a now a dichotomy of the way we talk. And I'm as guilty as anybody else. I say, are we talking about community care or secondary care? Actually, I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to start saying secondary care and previous primary care is now the community of treatment that we have. And I think what we need to do about this question is we need to say, well, what what does our population look like? What way have we got in the vicinity? And what is the best way to provide those services? So it isn't one size fits all. It isn't the old fashioned outpatients GP scenario. It is, there's our demographics. That's our rurality. How are we gonna manage that? Now that'll take some quite clever planning and I'm jolly sure when we do it, make huge mistakes. But we get could, just to take this on a little bit further, uh, then Mark, I'll let you uh, in. Can I just uh, point out another question, which actually uh, really uh, uh, links in very closely to what we're talking about here. There seems to be an ongoing debate as to what community mm. actually means. Mm -hmm. What does the panel regard community mm. to mean? Patients' homes, GP practices, medical centres, peripheral hospitals, district general hospitals, etc, etc, etc. Until we resolve this, the way forward remains somewhat difficult. All of the above. Mm. Mm. I think it is all of the above, but what's interesting is service within five days. Mm. There's no way you're going to get that in any hospital arranged treatment unless it's an emergency treatment for quote unquote symptoms. But having said that, so where is that treatment going to come from? It's going to come from general practice. And that merely pushes forward what I was saying earlier. We need to educate our, our practitioners at, at uh, undergraduate level so that they all, to some extent, can deal with these problems so that we don't have the massive problem arriving in so-called clinics, whether they're community-based or, 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 or in a hospital. I think what is community in this case, it's all of the things you've mentioned. How we embrace that community is how we pull those different things together. And yes, maybe we're going to need to pull in different technologies, whether that is Skype, 
uh, the internet, teleconferencing, whatever, all of those things become possibilities. They all only become possibilities, of course, with money. So it's going to be a case of balancing the accounts and deciding how we can give our community, total community now, the best service with the, with the amount of money we have available. And that, of course, is going to be something for the politicians and for our, our paymasters to sort out. Can I come in on a point about telemedicine and the rurality issue? I think what we have to recognise in Wales that there are, if you like, areas of Wales where the solutions will be different. Mm -hmm. We also have to look at the fact that deprivation has an effect. You are not going to effectively use telemedicine where you've got people whose reading age is six and their ability to assimilate a piece of medical information is questionable at best. So you're going to be dealing with face-to-face -face description and explanation for people like that. They won't get you over Skype. Can I refer to another question at that point here? Uh, it does not appear currently that there is overwhelming interest in managing pain outside a medical model in primary care. Is this reasonable? And if not, how do we change the engagement of fellow health professionals who work outside hospital practice? I'm going to stand up and be controversial. I find it difficult to engage with many of my colleagues in primary care. They have a 10-minute appointment system dictated to by the government, which says you have to see six patients every hour. And if they reduce the number of patients that they're seeing, they then tell they're not seeing enough patients. So for a start, we've got this model, which is dictated to by state, saying you've got to see so many patients every hour. That's the first problem. The second problem is, which is a solution in many areas, is COF and, and QIP, as they now call it as well, where we're trying to raise standards, but there isn't a COF for pain. So what happens is the concentration of general practice goes into where there are COFs. I am not surprised there isn't a cough on pain because it is such a large and vast area that the money that would have had to be put into it would have been considerable. So that's probably why it's been avoided up to date. But the problem is that they're focusing their attention on the areas they've been told to focus their attention on and also where the money goes. And it's amazing how well diabetes has done since COF came in. Diabetes has done magnificently and we're getting really good results in diabetes because the money's been put into that direction and then the <laughs> results have followed. I don't believe enough money has been put into pain. I do understand there are limitations of, of a budget. I'm not an idiot who believes that there's a limitless or bottomless pit. But what I do think we're going to have to do is we're going to have to be a little bit more diverse in how we approach it. And the one way we can get into general practices is when we mix pain in with something else. So for instance, if we look at something that has been sold well to the general practitioners like diabetes, if you give a lecture or if a, le a lecture is given which can be sponsored by industry or whatever on various different forms of diabetic control and you bring into that same lecture neuropathic pain and maybe erectile dysfunction, by bringing those three things which are all relevant to diabetes, you suddenly capture the audience's interest. Can I just pursue a little bit the, the cough business? Yep. A lot of people talk about coughs and of course people working in uh, secondary care don't fully understand all that. It seems to be expressed by a large number of people that no cough for pain is a problem. Do you agree with that? And is it something that uh, stands any chance of changing? Whether there should be a cough for pain, I mean ultimately government will debate that, to, to that for a while yet to come. What does COF do with any disease area within a practice? What COF does is the first thing is you have to draw up a register of all patients who have that problem. So in diabetes, you had to create a diabetic register. So that immediately tells you how many patients in your practice have diabetes. At the moment, there's no such register in pain. So the <coughs> general practitioners have no actual way at the moment of coming out and saying, this is how many people we have with acute pain and this is how many people we have with chronic pain. So if nothing else, if that was the only bit of cough that came in, if they just said two points a year for creating a register showing how many people have pain that's been ongoing past the time of normal repair, past the 12-week mark, even if they just did that, that would be a massive starting point because it would at least give us an idea of the size of the problem for budgeting for the future and for the pro provision of clinics. I want uh, to get Sue's opinion on this as a non-doctor. Mm -hmm. And to tease that out, I'm going to just quote this question here. Having been on secondment from a secondary care paid service to set up a community service, uh, I've worked with GPs and I've been exposed to their systems. Uh, it seems to me that there's still a huge divide between primary and secondary care services. How do we see that uh, we can get these two camps coming together? Thank you, Mark. Well, just listening with great interest to that, and it, it's lovely to hear a group of really enthusiastic people who want to see things change. And I'm, one, I'm going to ask you a question. Does anybody know whether 
the commissioning directives for chronic non-malignant pain that were devised in 2009 have ever been rescinded? They have not been rescinded. No. They haven't been rescinded. Excellent. They haven't been rescinded. Can I take just a moment to remind you what some of them say? They actually say that by March 2009, planners and commissioners will ensure that plans to reconfigure existing secondary care pain specialist services based on assessment of local patient needs are established to ensure patients with complex CNMP are triaged and referred appropriately using evidence-based care pathways. Now, there's actually three or four of those that go on to explain what the aim of all of that work was. Now, we mustn't lose that work, I don't think. And I think somewhere along the way, we've kind of lost that a little bit. Now, if I'm not mistaken, and this is one of the last times I'm going to use this, Rob, mm -hmm. primary care and secondary care are now embraced in local health boards. So we should be using these directives to encourage local health boards to start to put in place those kinds of services. That's what we should be doing. I'm coming from a more strategic approach than my colleagues who are actual clinicians are coming from. Mark, don't look at me when you mention budget. It frightens me. Because <coughs> this is why I say to people, don't please, I'm not from WAG. I'm from the NHS. Okay? Not my responsibility to set the budget. Sorry. No, it's okay. It happens all the time. And that's why I was keen to mention it. So we straddle that for you. And I've been looking for a way in now for a while because certain things happened, which I don't need to talk about in in WAG about the chronic conditions work and it's come to a stalling point and I'm going to go back and find a way in again and I've tried several ways in because clearly as you said back pain massive back and neck pain is my zone on focus on and I'm desperate to see how we can get that right sorted out with a proper community approach to it so don't forget about these guys you know you need to be asking your health boards what are we doing about these directives that came yeah. out yeah. Where's my role in them? How are we going to take this forward? Because they're four years behind. Yeah, well, that was the point I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is the problem, that those words have appeared, and many of us have contributed to those to words. Absolutely. But you used the word stalled? Stalled. stalled. Yeah. And that, that actually is the problem, isn't it? The process has stalled. It's, and, we, and shouldn't be, we shouldn't be surprised about that, though, because I was just looking for the actual date that this was signed off. But, um, you know, the, the actual document was generated in June 2008. We've had a financial maelstrom hit mm. the health service, so it's hardly surprising that we've stalled on this. There have been a lot of things that have been deemed to be more worthy. Maybe that's because we haven't shouted loud enough. But things have stalled financially. There's been no money to pump prime a lot of things. We've had to do things on a shoestring, and the reason that I'm the only representative from my, my health board, I should say, is that the rest of them are having to make sure that they're in work because future funding is predicated on yeah. certain requests and demands that have been placed on us by politicians to actually fulfil yeah. This document. Can I just pick up on that mm. point? I think that's a very good point that you raise, Rob. I think one thing we're not very clever at doing, all of us, and I include mm. myself in this, though I've tried on occasions, but very hard, is actually really emphasising the economic element of it. We don't like talking about finances, do we? Because, you know, that isn't our first port of call but sometimes we have to because if that's what's driving us at the moment then we have to prove why the pain agenda is so effective yes. financially yes. and we're not unfortunately at the moment too clever at doing that so if anybody is please help me because I'd love to do it. Right I'm just going to throw a spanner into the works and of course actually the problem is disinvestment and we all know that buckets of money are thrown at things which are worse than unhelpful are positive just mental. Until we master the disinvestment thing, we're not going to move forward. It's a case we've tried to argue from the delivery unit's perspective a number of times. If we can avoid some of the burden of pain on the prescription, for Wales, that is a direct either redirection of money or saving because we have free prescriptions. If you were arguing this in England, it would be a different debate. But here, that's a direct saving of money because we have free prescriptions. Now, you're clearly not going to save 28 million, but you may well save a quarter of it, which would be a massive amount of money. So the more help we can get on trying to explain this and get this financial element worked out would be gratefully received. 
Remember, it is only neck and back pain, the figures I've quoted. Only neck and back. For North Wales, the prescription cost, that's all we're talking about here, was <coughs> quoted at £6.4 million. Pounds. OK, Mark, if you want to reply to that. I wasn't suggesting there weren't ways we could find a list of these patients. What I was aiming with, with saying it would be useful having a cough register is it would highlight it for each GP individually because they have to, with the other cough, you've got to put somebody as, as lead for diabetes, etc. And as mm. soon as you created a cough in pain, somebody in the practice would have to be lead for pain. And therefore, somebody would be, need a bit of education within the practice for pain, and so it would spread the word that way. So I wasn't meaning we couldn't find the data. I'm sure we searched, we could find it. As it goes, the potential cost savings from prescriptions, they are astronomical. And a few years ago, before we became a joint, joint trust, uh, Swansea made a very concerted effort to save money. And I remember when I was prescribing lead in my practice for seven years, and when I first took over my practice, we were prescribing 44% generic. By the time I left, we were in the top three generic prescribers in Swansea. And in the last year that I ran the budget for my practice uh, on prescribing, I saved £330,000 on my budget, of which not one penny went into chronic pain. And that is the problem. We can get people involved in saving money, but if they're not going to see, if they're going to see that money disappear into a mass called the, mm. the trust and vanish into orthopedic surgery or something, then it's going to achieve nothing. If I look at our own trust at the moment, I know of one patient is costing £4,000 a month, and I know that there are about 30 of those across the trust, and the patient in, in question has low back pain and uses 18 800 microgram fentanyl lollies a day. Work that out quickly, money-wise, and you'll find it's about £4,000. And at the moment, if I manage to change him, not a penny of that would come into the chronic pain budget. But quite frankly, that's what I would like, because I would like to set up a separate clinic once a week to see just those patients. Take that prescribing away from that poor GP who's been landed with that horrible prescription, take it away from them, and let's convert that patient onto appropriate medication that won't destroy his teeth and may well help him with his back. And at the same time, save about half a million a year, because that's the potential just on that small group of patients within our trust. So, and I'm sure there are similar patients out in yours, unless we're the worst trust around. Now, time's pressing. I've just got one more question, and I'm just going to give each panellist the opportunity to give two or three sentences, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to call it to a halt. I'm just cutting across before we get to that final question because there's just time for me to say thank you to all those who took part in that debate at the Welsh Pain Society annual scientific meeting. That's Drs Mark Turtle, Rob Davis, Mark Ritchie and Sue Beckman. And I'll be following up on their theme in the next edition of Airing Pain when I'll be joining a community pain management programme in the largest yet most sparsely populated county in Wales. I'll just remind you of Pain Concern's usual words of caution that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. All editions of Airing Pain are available for download from Pain Concern's website and CD copies can be obtained direct from Pain Concern. All the contact details, should you wish to make a comment about these programmes via blog, message board, email, Facebook, Twitter or pen and paper, are on our website, which is painconcern.org.uk. So, with all that said, here's the final question. How do we engage with primary care to enable progress towards community based service? Moving current secondary care services to community is only part of the issue, but in order for secondary care to concentrate on the most needy, there is a need for earlier care of patients presenting with pain. How does pa the panellists think this could be addressing achieved? pain problems early? We have to right. train the staff working at that stage in the, in the patient's journey. We need to give them the necessary academic tools to deal with it. We need to give them the necessary skills and confidence to deal with it. It's a oh. training issue. I uh, agree with Robin that it's a training issue, but I think it's more than just a training issue for medics. I think the training needs to start with our population. We need to be speaking to our patients out there and encouraging <coughs> self-management to a large extent. And the only way we're going to do that is by patient education as well as doctor education. Ultimately, though, I agree, education is going to be the answer so that a larger portion can be handled at a lower level and then move up to the ones that really do need to be in secondary care. Okay, Sue? So? I think the education debate is fantastic and brilliant, but I'd like to combine the education with that new sense of community so the education is where it's needed 
We don't have those artificial boundaries anymore. But let's have the right people in the right place, wherever that is. Thank you very much, Sue, Rob, uh, and Mark. And thank you very much, audience. I'm sorry we can't go on any longer. <laughs>